We can use global variables to pass information between tasks in an RTOS, but there are a number of possible pitfalls when we do so. Let's take a look at those pitfalls and how we can use queues as one way to avoid them. We'll start with the example we saw in the last couple of lectures. One task would change the value of a global variable and another task would read it. For example, in our LED challenge, we had one task update a global variable with the value of the delay, and the second task would read the global variable in order to change the LED's blink rate to that delay value. Assuming the global variable can be updated in one instruction cycle, this is not necessarily a bad approach. However, what happens if another thread also wants to send the same kind of information to thread B? In this scenario, it's possible that task A changes the global variable, then task C changes it again before task B gets a chance to read it. Uh-oh. It can get even more sinister than that. If you're working with 32-bit data in a 32-bit machine, you can generally read and write numbers to memory in a single instruction cycle. However, what if you're working with something larger than the data width of your memory? Let's look at an example. The ESP32's memory is 32 bits wide. If we wanted to save a 64-bit number to memory, it would require two places in memory and two write instructions. Because the ESP32 is little endian, it would save the first half of the 64-bit number first like this. Ideally, it would save the second half next in the following memory address, but let's say that at this moment, task B interrupts us and reads the 64-bit number from memory. Uh-oh again. This 64-bit global variable is not thread safe, as we can't guarantee it will be written or read without being interrupted by another task. When task B tries to read this number, half of it will be overwritten, giving us garbage data. Here's another possible scenario. Let's say task A begins writing a piece of data to memory. This can be a multiple word value, like in the previous example, or several variables that are supposed to be together, like a struct. During that writing process, task C preempts task A and then writes its own values to the same global variable or struct. It overwrites all of the data. When it's done, task A picks up where it left off, writing the rest of the data. As you can see, this creates another problem, as the data no longer reflects what either task A or task C intended. There are a few ways to prevent this from happening. One way is to use atomic operations, which guarantee that certain instructions and memory accesses can be done in a single instruction cycle or without being interrupted. These are often dependent on the availability of certain assembly instructions, though. Another way is to use kernel objects to tell other tasks not to mess with our data. A mutex or semaphore could help here, but we'll cover those in future episodes. What we want is a queue, which allows us to pass uninterrupted messages between tasks, kind of like passing notes in grade school. A queue is like a line of people waiting at a famous cupcake vendor or for a ride at a theme park. It's a simple first-in, first-out system. In most embedded applications, they usually have global scope so that they can be accessed by all tasks. Now, task A can copy in some data to the queue, and it will appear at the front of the queue. As long as we use the built-in kernel functions, writing to a queue is atomic, which means that another task cannot interrupt it during the writing process. Also note that adding something to a queue is done by value and not by reference. That means whenever you save something to the queue, the entire contents of that variable, struct, string, or buffer, are copied. You can place a pointer into a queue, but you'll want to be sure the referenced value is still in scope by the time the pointer is read by the receiving task. Free RTOS queues are not bound by type, so you can ideally copy anything you want to them, assuming you've allocated enough memory space for each element. You can keep filling up the queue so long as there are enough elements. Another task asynchronously reads from the queue at any time. This will remove the first item in the queue and cause all other items to shift forward by one element, freeing up another spot for the other tasks to write to. We can set a timeout in the receiving task to wait a specified number of ticks if the queue is empty. If no new tasks are placed in the queue during that time, the receive function will return a false status code, letting us know that nothing was read. 
Similarly, if the queue is full, a sending task can be set to wait a number of ticks before the send function times out with a false status code. Once again, this lets us know that a task couldn't use the queue and we can try again or drop the item. That, or maybe we just need to make the queue bigger. The queue management page on freertos.org has a list of all the functions we need to work with queues. The ones we care most about are create, delete, send, and receive, which I'll show you how to use in a minute. Notice that there are static queues, which means that the basic queues are created in heap memory. Additionally, you should not send or receive items from a queue from within an interrupt service routine using these basic functions. That's because interrupts do not depend on the tick timer and should not wait any amount of time for the queue. As a result, you should use these special from ISR functions when working with a queue inside an interrupt service routine. Let's start with another Arduino sketch, much like we've done in previous episodes. Just like before, I'm going to limit this program to one core on the ESP32. Then I'll define my queue length. This is the maximum number of items the queue can hold. I'll also declare my queue as a global variable so that both of my tasks can access it. I'll create a simple task and call it print messages. In it, I'll create a local variable named item. This is where we'll store the value we read from the queue. Note it's an int as I plan to send integer values through the queue. In my forever loop, we'll use xqReceive to read from the queue. The first parameter is the handle to the queue, which we declared as a global variable earlier. Next is the address of the local variable where the queue item will be copied to. While it's not necessary, I'll cast this address as a void pointer as a reminder that it's what the function expects. The third parameter is the timeout in number of ticks. The task will go into the block state for this many ticks while waiting for something to appear in the queue. If we set it to zero, then it will return immediately, giving us PD true if something was read from the queue or PD false if not. If we got something, we'll print it to the console. After that, we'll wait for one second. In setup, we'll configure the serial object and print a welcome message as we've been doing. Then we'll need to create our queue. We call xqcreate to do this and set our handle to the return value. We give it the number of items, which is five in this case, and the size of each item. You can use anything here, ints, characters, structs, or even just a chunk of memory to store whatever you want. Then we'll start our print messages task, giving it some stack memory and a priority of one. In loop, we'll create a simple static number that will increment with each execution of loop. Next, we'll call xqsend, giving it the handle to our queue and the address of our counter. Again, I'll explicitly cast it as a void pointer. I'll also tell it to time out after 10 ticks. If it can't copy the value to the queue, the function will return PD false, which we can check. I'll print out an error message here. Note that it's generally a good idea to assign one hardware peripheral per task, which means that I should have my print messages task handle all serial input and output and not have serial commands in other tasks. However, this is a demo, so I'll leave this print statement here. It will let us know that the number could not be sent to the queue. After, I'll increment the number and delay the task for one second. Let's upload and run this. When it's done, open the serial terminal. You should see the value being printed to the screen increment about once per second. Let's head back to the code and make an adjustment. We'll change the delay in the send task to 500 milliseconds, which means that the queue is now filling up faster than it's being read. Upload this again. In the serial terminal, we can see that after a few posts, the queue will be completely full, as the sending task will tell us that it can't add items to the queue. You should also see that our program will begin dropping items that it can't add to the queue and just moving on to the next value. This may or may not be desired behavior in your program, so think about it carefully when implementing queues. Next, we'll adjust the delays so that the receiving task will look for items in the queue at a faster rate than they're added. We'll also print the received item value outside of the receive if statement so you can see what happens when no new items are received. Let's upload this again. As you can see, we print out the value of the item variable faster than it's updated. Also, it's important to note that the local variable does not change when the receive function returns with no new items. Here's your challenge for this episode. We're going to use queues to fix the possible issues of using a global variable to control something in another task. You should make two tasks and two queues. 
task A needs to print any new messages from Q2 to the serial terminal. It should also read serial input from the user and echo it back to the terminal, giving the appearance of a command line interface. If the user enters the command delay followed by a space and a number, the task should parse that command and send the number to Q1. Task B must monitor Q1 for any new values. If a new value shows up, it must update a local variable with that value. The local variable is used to control the delay of a blinking LED, just like we've seen before. However, I also want you to add another message that goes back to task A. Every time the LED blinks 100 times, copy a string to Q2, which should be printed out by task A. Optionally, add the number of times the LED blinked to this message to be printed out. You might need to use a struct to make this happen. When I run this, the Arduino serial terminal requires me to enter a full line at a time. To mimic a console, I need to use another serial program like PuTTY. Here I can enter characters, and they're immediately echoed back to me. If you're using PuTTY or another serial terminal program, you might have to mess with the new line and carriage return characters to get it to look right. Nothing happens if I type random stuff, but if I enter delay, space, and a number, it will update the LED blink rate. I also have a message come back to task A letting me know the number was received, but you don't have to do that. If I make the LED blink very quickly, you can see that I get notified every time it blinks 100 times. Good luck with this challenge, as I know it's a long one. In the next episode, we'll examine how we can lock a shared resource using a mutex so that only one task can access it at a time. See you then!